All right, this video will be about um, using lights in Cinema 4D. Uh, the version is 14, but this should be valid for any version. So in general, you can create a light by clicking on this bulb icon. And the light itself will not be visible. If I hit render now, anything is black. That's because there's no geometry so far. The light can fall on top. So whenever we have a light source, we should have some geometry to put light on. I will just create a cube, put a sphere on top, move the sphere right on top of the cube, maybe like so, and make sure that the light source is above my geometry. So one of the most important things is the position of the light source. And now you can see that the light wraps around the sphere and hits the top side of the cube. Before you do anything else, you should give the light source a reasonable name. Maybe point light or something. You can tell that it's still a light source by this bulb icon and any light source should be named. So there are, uh, the light source can be positioned like anything else. You can move it around using the arrows in the 3D view. You can just hit E to move, click anywhere uh, or rather nowhere like, like here and move it around freely. So now the light comes from here or you can switch using the middle mouse button or this icon in the right top corner and move the light source just from the top view so you can make sure the light is not moving upwards or downwards like that or you can use the front view and move it around like that. Alright, now let's uh, have a look at the number of things you can change about the light source. The light source I just named point light has lots of different options. The basic ones are just whether the light is enabled or not. You can tell when you turn off the light source that all the ge geometry is still visible and if you hit render there is some standard light source um, that's illuminating our scene. But whenever you turn on the light by clicking here or there, this standard light source will be turned off. I would recommend you to always use your own light sources because that really makes the atmosphere of your scene. Of course you can turn off the visibility of a single light source by clicking here twice and you can deactivate whether it's being rendered or not.
by using this bottom little circle. But usually you just turn it on or off here. And if you want to switch off the visibility of the light sources in general, you can just click on filter and turn light off. So that way this light source is still be used in the rendering, but it's not visible as a geometry like in this case. When you're illuminating, always use one light source at a time, so you can really make sure that the, the one light source you're just moving around is um, really doing the effect you want. So if I had another light source, like source B, I would always turn the first one off, click on source B so I can move this one, and then I can check, okay, that's the effect of the left light source, and then I isolate the first source again and check back this, and at the end I check both sources in combination. Okay. For now I just delete the second one and care about my first point light. So far I just moved this light source around by hand, but of course you can click on coordinates and use numbers to define where this light source is located. This would be below ground, so use the Y value to move it up. <clears throat> I rarely use that. Scaling doesn't make sense for a point light either, but you could use rotation for, for different types of lights, but not the point light. So all you need is move around the coordinates. So one thing you should notice about light sources is that they don't get calculated like in real life. But there are some rules that are similar to reality, like here's a light source and it illuminates best the surfaces that are in a really 90 degree angle to to the light source and if the angle of the surface gets flatter, like here or there, um, the surface gets darker so it doesn't get that much light. Same here, you can see some specular, like a shiny spot on the sphere and if the angle gets flatter then the sphere turns darker. You can tell in the preview as well, this area is very bright and gets, the, gets darker the flatter the angle. Okay, let's go on to the general settings for my light source. There are always at least two things you should consider right after you placed your light. That's the color of your light source. As a general rule you can say that there is no light source that is absolutely neutral. In most cases this color will turn either towards a warm tone or a rather cold one. So of course you could just click here right in this area and use a color of your own. So you can choose pretty much any color. That's one way of doing it. I personally find it rather hard to work with pure RGB values. Sometimes it's easier to change the color using 
this little arrow here right underneath this area and turn it to HSV. With HSV you can just use the, the tone you would like to have, that's called uh, the hue. If I want something warm like a sun, I go in the 30s. The next thing I can change is the saturation and the general brightness. So if you want to, to have a really pure light source, just use 100% brightness or if you want to have it rather muddy and dark, you can turn the brightness down. But generally I use full brightness and not too much saturation and something around 30. It's really warm if you turn it below and if I want to have something like daylight I use maybe 210. Like always you can click on the surface to choose more options and you can store colors as well for example if you want to save down some daylight color and some sunlight color you can just save this down like that there's another way of um, setting the light colors which is by clicking here on this little arrow right in front of the word color and you can click on use temperature to choose a natural light color which ranges from really really warm to almost neutral and then it goes into a blue bluish color really good for natural light colors I will close this now so after you defined the light color you can change the intensity <clears throat> note it goes above 100 percent just by scrolling upwards or typing in 200 and in general I would experiment a lot with those three things I will sum it up the position the color and the intensity in general I will, will rarely use the same brightness for two different sources so when I have one thing that's supposed to be warm and really bright it will look like this and if I want to have some more light within the shadows I will take another light source maybe turn it bluish and make it a lot less intense than the warm light source so I turn this down maybe 70% and turn this up now when I render this I have a dominant light source that's warm and I have a weaker light source which is cold so there should always be a hierarchy between the light sources this is dominant and this is I don't know less important whatever another very general thing you should define is the way the light source uh, emits light 
The standard illumination is omni, so the light rays go in all directions. You can tell by this icon. But you can also go for a spot, which only emits lights or light rays within that uh, spot. Have a look. The light doesn't go uh, further than this region, which is really nice for lamps, for example. Then there is an infinite light source, which needs a direction as well. This light source is really good for imitating sunlight, so the light comes in parallel rays from this direction. And then there is an area light, which looks like this. And the area light has a very, very soft way of illuminating our scene. <clears throat> we will discuss, uh, discuss each light source, starting with the Omni light. Again, the Omni light doesn't need a direction, it just emits rays from its center in any direction. First thing you notice when rendering is that the light doesn't um, drop shadows. There is no shadow underneath the sphere. There's only uh, like object shadows, so the surfaces turn darker and the back sides seen from the light source are completely dark, but there's no dropping shadows. So if you want to change that, just go to for, from non to shadow maps for a start and have a look there you go now the sphere drops a shadow onto the cube maybe I will just use a huge plane under underneath so now you can see that the light source is illuminating our scene. It's creating shiny spots on um, on the ground, like here, and on the sphere. And there's a huge shadow running away from the light source on this on the box and onto our plane. Now we have different kinds of shadows. We have either none, a soft shadow, a ray traced shadow, it says hard. So let's have a look. Now you get a really, really crisp shadow, which is okay for extremely small light sources. Or if you want to save render time, this goes really, really quick. And then there is an area shadow which looks like this. You notice the rendering takes a little longer, in some cases a lot longer, if you use area shadows, but it's the most realistic shadow you can get in Cinema 4D because it's moving from rather crisp, depending on the light source, to really soft. It's really nice, I think. Of course, there's more options to shadows, we will discuss in a few minutes, but for now I leave it at shadow maps. Now there's another main option, which is visible light. In most cases, I wouldn't use that option, but I will just show you. This is visible light. Now this is a really strong effect you can reduce, of course. Then there is volumetric. 
which in this case looks pretty similar, but we will discuss the difference later. And there is something that's called inverse volumetric, which uh, is not visible right now, but it basically turns the effect around. You can use light sources for just dropping shadows or for some effects and still turn the illumination off, which I just did. You can use it as ambient illumination, which um, doesn't really respect or it doesn't at all respect the angles, the shadow, uh, the, the light. Um, it, the light goes to the surfaces, so let me just show you the difference. When I have ambient illumination turned on, anything seems extremely flat. And if I turn ambient illumination off, you will get this 3D looking objects. So for some graphical stuff you might like the ambient illumination but for realistic scenes this is probably never really useful. Now you can see that there are some shiny bits where the light hits the surface directly and it comes back to your eye, you will see some shiny spots. You can turn them off by deactivating specular. Looks like this. But in general you can turn this off and you can define each material's specularity easier. Let's turn off the diffuse lighting, then you will see only the specularity, like so. Might be quite useful if you just want to, to increase the specularity, but in general I will turn it off. Um, we're not going to talk about global illumination. And I don't think we, we will talk about this Okay, um, that's what you can do on the general side. This um, works for pretty much any light source, so whatever we just discussed should work for spot, infinite and area lights. Next is um, details. I will turn this back to OmniLight because the details look different on each light source a little. And there are some options like contrast you can have a look at. It makes the borderline sharper from bright to dark if you turn it up. If you turn it down, it will get a little softer. In general, I keep this at 0%. Maybe there are some cases where it makes sense to turn that one up. A rather interesting option is the Shadow Caster. That way, this light source will only drop shadows. I can't show you that effect by a single light source only, but if I use a second one, like this is my actual light and that one is my shadow caster. I can show you. If I give the caster a shadow map, I can render a shadow of a light source that doesn't emit light. So this is my 
actual light and this is my shadow caster. In some cases it's quite clever to have the ability to um, manipulate the shadows uh, without respecting the actual light source. So in other words you can fake stuff by making a difference between the light source and the shadow caster. Okay, let's delete the other uh, light and bring the point light back to standard by deactivating the shadow caster option among details. Maybe you noticed that the point light illuminates any surface no matter how far it's away. When I put it here, this area is just as bright as if I move the light source further away. So far, the Illumination is just considering the angle towards the surface. When I put the light source in a rather low angle towards the surface, it turns darker. When the angle is closer to 90 degrees, so it gets more frontal to it, then it gets brighter. So bright and dark. Or darker. In reality, however, you would like to have an effect that the light source loses its power by distance. You can do this by using the fall off option and turn it from non to inverse square, which is called physically accurate. Now you get a little globe around your light source and this shows the range of that light source. Let me just show you. Of course there's some uh, light rays that um, or the light rays go further than that range but the most intense illumination takes place closer to the light source like so. Here it's bright and there it's rather dark. And if I move this light source further away, it gets darker. So there's no general rule for using the fall off. In some cases you might want to turn this option off because for this specific light source that effect is not needed or not appreciated so you can just leave it like this. In many other cases you will want this option for using inverse square. You can or should use this in conjunction with the radius. If you turn this one up the light source reaches further. If you make this really really small value then this might look like the light from a little lighter. That's a bit dark. Still maybe like so. So this doesn't reach far and you should always use the radius in conjunction with the intensity. So a huge intensity like this can be reduced by a rather small radius. Or if you use a 
huge radius and a really strong intensity, you get a lot of light. Maybe like this. Okay. Next thing is to... You can use a linear falloff, which works just like that. Here you get 100% of your intensity and then it goes linearly towards zero until here. So this is the actual range of that light source. Now it only hits the surfaces here and now it should reach further. By the way, what's really important for my work is to have neutral surfaces, so I would really recommend you to turn the basic shading color to gray, because so far any object gets rendered in a bluish color. Let me just show you by turning off the light source, you can see they have a blue color and if you go to mode and then there should be project mode and then project you can turn the default object color to 80% gray that way you can see much better what you're doing okay back to your light source I will just turn it on and now you can see this is how far the light reaches. If you go linearly, then there's an option step, which turns the light off really abruptly like this. Here is the end. There are very rare occasions where you will use this option. So in general, use non inverse square or linear. There's one option which you might find quite cool. It's called used use gradient and it's pretty similar to the fall off because um, in, in the fall off you can reduce the intensity of the light source and with a gradient you can change its color. You can let the light source start with a warm color and use a blue color at the end. Let's have a look. That way you have something warm in, uh, close to the light source and it goes to blue further away. Of course in reality I don't think this is possible but it's really cool for atmospheric lighting for example in night shows or if you want to render a discotheque. I'll just turn it off and go back to maybe inverse square and the standard value which is 500. Okay. Now the next thing is called visibility. You can use a or you first you should make sure um, a visible light is activated on the main page. So let's just go to from non to visible and among visibility you can define this effect. First you can turn off a fall off which makes this look like a transparent sphere. Usually you will want a fall off. OK, 
Okay, it ranges from 0 to 100 and um, it's just rendering some shininess uh, on top of your image so it doesn't really consider occlusion this effect visibility um, will by standard not consider any kind of occlusion if I put something in in front it will be mainly cut off like this if I move it in front of the light source okay it goes like this I remembered this differently but that's fine then then um, you can change the outer and inner distance of that effect this is a huge a huge sphere which ends here and if you want to turn the visibility down you can just go to 50 centimeters which makes it look like a little glowing star it's pretty good for imitating um, light bulbs or something and you can use a inner distance as well so the fall off takes place from here to there the sampling distance can be lowered in case you see some artifacts or if you have really detailed geometry around that light source but of course sampling values lower than this will increase the render time and there are some more options to play around with like dust and dithering most important of course is the brightness itself so if you want to have this effect to be rather subtle you can turn it down to 10% and in most cases a low brightness value might look more natural than if you make it maybe like, like so you will rarely see this in reality but there are other ways of of visibility because let's just set up some test I will just make a small bar out of a cube and put this close to the light source like this and now let's have a look I would like to have that bar to split my light rays and so far you can see that the light is just going more or less through my object and if I want to change this I can turn the visible light from visible to volume volumetric this effect takes more rendering time but it creates some rays like that you can see here this way there are more realistic um, calculations and when you have some 
more objects like this <clears throat> for example in a church let me just copy this several times I should get by increasing the radiuses some more um, sort of negative rays. I hope you can see them. They go like this. Uh, it's really great for atmosphere again. Of course there are some um, sampling distances to be respected. If you have really really fine geometry then you should the sampling distance low so it's low enough to really um, take those um, small grids into calculation but in many cases you will be fine with just um, a low sampling. Okay. Now I can show you inverse volumetric as well. That's an effect you will rarely see in reality anywhere where it should be dark some rays will be emitted. like so. Um, for the use of uh, visibility light I would recommend to use this only if you really need it so this shouldn't be turned on by standard but in, in some cases visible might be enough or volumetric might be really great. Of course you can fake this effects in Photoshop as well, so you have more control, but up to you. I will just turn it off and show you something which is far more important than visibility, which is the shadow. I will just uh, delete my cross here and uh, go back here. So we have um, the shadow options in general here again and um, let's talk about shadow maps like always there is some intensity value so you can reduce the intensity of shadow maps so there's only a slight hint of a shadow you can go 100% like this or you can make them also darker than 100% this is more clearly to understand when using a second light source again. So let's have a look. Um, the second light source, I put it to 50%. So now you can see that when I use my point light here in shadow and I go intensity 50%, it will look like this. When I go 100%, it, it look, it's going to look like that and if I go below that it makes it just a stronger shadow. Of course it doesn't look um, very realistic anymore in this case but um, it's a good way to play around with that especially for um, additional light sources or if you want to fake something you can, you can use um, some, some more shadows here. So you might wonder why is this light source looking blue? Um, that's because the, um, the light source is warm and as far as I know it just takes the opposite color 
for shadows. But in, if you are in reasonable uh, density areas like 100%, this effect is rather subtle. Transparency should be turned on as well, but uh, if you have transparent objects, that is. More important is, um, I just delete the other light source, is the sampling of the shadows. The shadow map here is um, turned to 250 by 250 pixels by standard, which is rather low. If you want to have it crisper, you can go up to 1000 by 1000. This gives you a better defined shadow, which takes more um, memory, of course. And there's one nice trick. You can go below 250 with the resolution by just typing in something here. And that way you really get a very diffuse and fast calculating shadow. So again the standard is 250 but you can go below that or above that. In some cases there are problems with shadow maps. You might They might not start right where they should be like this shadow should start right here, but you can tell that it's starting a little before that. So in some cases you can fight this effect by turning on the sampling ra radius or turning it down. And it gets a little jaggy here, so that's uh, something to play around. You can change the bias as well, or bias, whatever. So in general shadow maps are fast and if you play around with them they can lead to really nice results. Some funny effect is the outline shadow which looks like this. So this only shows the, the soft area of the shadow, it's called outline shadow. There's some option with the cone, I never used. Probably a new option, but I would just turn it off for realistic results. So the other shadow you have is ray traced. It doesn't offer too many options, it's just how dense the shadow should be and if, a, if it should have a, a color of its own, like this one would be a red shadow and that's about it. By standard I would turn this to black. Then there is some more option uh, which is called area. The area sh shadow um, works for any light source um, that's that effect that goes from crisp to soft. You should always um, think about the sampling rate. If I may show you, then uh, you have some noise going on here. 
and you could fight this noise by turning the sampling rate very high but if you think about it in most cases there will be a texture on the ground and sometimes this noise really mixes well with the texture so you don't need to turn this up I will just do this for demonstrating purposes but it really takes a lot of render time so um, you don't always or in many cases it might not even be good to um, aim for really really um, clean images because in the reality is uh, rather noisy as well so I will go really really low with that let's have a look and I think this can be nice too especially if there's a concrete texture on the ground or something so always use the lowest value possible especially if you have more than one light source going on if I may add uh, another thing I would use the best quality only for the dominant light source if you have weaker light sources you can reduce their sampling as well. Okay, um, next is uh, photometric. Uh, with that option you can define the intensity of that light source with physical, um, physical units. This kind of overrides um, the, the intensity. Um, you can, however, use um, profiles for lights as well. Um, we, we should do this um, when we use IES lights. Then you get the ability to use photometric data and you have to load in an IES light. You can Google that and you will get a load of uh, lots of profiles from manufacturers sites. Um, but for our introduction to lighting you probably don't need IES lights. Um, let's stick with Omni lights for now. So next thing is caustics. Caustics are another effect um, you might not use on a daily basis, but it looks really cool. Um, it is about bundling light rays. So when you have a um, reflecting or a transparent material, I will just create a transparent material which refracts the light so maybe like 1.5 so you can see it's kind of distorting light rays so they can get bundled at a point and I use this glass material I just created onto my sphere then I can use this light source to shoot rays into the sphere and when they uh, get bundled, they will create um, a caustic spot right on the ground. In order to see this effect, I should turn on surface caustics and um, make sure the caustics effect is activated within the render settings so I go to effect caustics and there's the option surface caustics activated let's have a look whether it works or not there you can see it it's, it's of course um, 
not the way we want it. It's a really, really low sampled effect uh, at the moment. But um, as a, I would like to give you a, a um, tip, uh, not a tip, a uh, hint. And um, this point light um, could be or should be a spot. And this spotlight should be aimed right at the sphere. So the computer only needs to calculate rays within that cone. So our, our um, caustics um, get a little more precise. And now there's quite a few options um, like the energy and the amount of photons we can shoot out. I will just use 10 times more and um, this is still not what I want. I think it's far too rough. So let's have a look at the surface caustics. Maybe there's um, some way to, to make this effect a little more realistic. Yeah, but in general it works and um, if you want to have this looking good, you will need some, some time to play around with it. But in general I would use one light source for um, creating caustics and then I just use a copy which doesn't um, shoot out photons for caustics. So this is for the light and this is for the caustics. So I can have one light source which does in only light, which uh, looks like this, the way we had it before. And then there's a caustic light which doesn't drop a shadow and which doesn't uh, illuminate anything. Let's have a look. Okay, for the caustic light I need to turn on illumination. Maybe not show it. So that way we have a separation between the illumination of the scene and this caustic effect. Of course, I can show you the classic. Um, if there is no material which, uh, which does um, caustics, uh, you won't see any. But let me just use a... or create a little ring here by using a tube. And now I use some gold material which is reflecting and this creates some caustics right here. So maybe that's a little strong. So I turn down the intensity of this light, yeah, but it's still kind of, well, it's something um, to play around with, basically. You can use caustics for the volume as well, so in case you have something transparent, like here, there should be um, some bundling light going on within that material as well. Okay, I turn off caustics and go to the render settings and delete the effect as well.
and switch over to noise. By standard that effect is turned off as well, but you can turn it on. If you go to illumination, it kind of uses this noise pattern to make your lighting rather dirty. In architectural images you will rarely use this, but you can could use this for faking clouds or to in order to fake dirty windows. There is um, a lot of things you can define about this noise pattern. You can change um, the type of noise as well. But this effect is rather hard to control because it wraps around any surface the light is falling on. But a nice thing is uh, using it for visibility. So in case you have visibility activated, I don't have right now, but let's go to visibility or, or excuse me, to general and turn visible light on. Then we should see something that's way too strong. Um, use brightness 50% and general intensity 200 and I should make sure that I have no inner distance within my visibility so now I should see some noise the waviness might come from the, the noise here but let's turn the brightness further down and you can tell that this goes rather irregular and when I turn the noise off this looks um, much cleaner so you can basically use this effect for spotlights maybe that makes it look a little like it's going through some foggy area here. Okay, let's turn that noise off. And there's some effect that's really popular, especially by beginners. Um, it's called lens effects. They make the light source Excuse me, for clarity's sake, we turn off visible light and go back to lens and we should as well turn the type to Omni. So now, this effect um, is calculated after the rendering and just puts a lens a flare in, in front of the light source. That's called Glow. There are more icons for that effect. And yeah, there's another one which is called Reflexes, which does something like this, or I show you something which is stronger. Stuff like that. It puts little spots and circles, uh, making it look like that light source goes through your lenses, through the lenses of your camera. Um, this effect is um, can be, of course, um, defined, but it's, um, it's sometimes in animation a bit um, sudden because. If there's something in front, the effect will be uh, turned off. And if your camera moves further, so you can see the... L okay, it can't work like this, but let's have another look. 
so now the effect is gone but as soon as your camera shows that light source the reflex goes on uh, in animation this leads to some some very uh, how to say um, very very sudden appearances of that maybe it's the same in reality but it's kind of distracting uh, just try it for yourself I go to inactive in both cases and now we get to something really special it's um, called project and um, I delete the material as well so we have a really simple scene again and so far the light is reaching and illuminating any object in our scene with, uh, which is within um, the, its range but in some cases you want to fake stuff and sometimes you want to have a light source maybe with a soft shadow and a warm color which is only affecting one object but not the rest and you can use a mode which include includes only the sphere for example I drag and drop the spheres from, uh, from my list and you can see in the preview now this light source is only affecting that sphere if I had another light source uh, which um, doesn't have um, any entries in that object list it would work for all and this one is specified so my specified light source the warm one illuminates the sphere so it appears yellowish and my all light which has a blue color hits any object right now let's do something different I go to the specified light source and change that mode from include to exclude so this warm light source only illuminates the box and the ground but not the sphere so whatever I put in my list here doesn't get light at the moment from that source same works the other way around of course I can include that so this object gets warm light the floor doesn't of course I could work like this now I go to all and make this include the floor plane only so each object has its own light source this appears like some foolish um, playing around right now but there are actually some cases um, in which you might like this option if you just want to hit um, have an additional light source which has a really really specific task then this mode is good now let's get to something even more complex you might have noticed that right after your objects there are some more buttons now what do they do one by one the first one is deactivating the um, the diffuse illumination so it's only showing speculars when I turn this on it gets the full illumination and when I turn off the speculars now I will get an illumination 
but without specularity. That way I have specularity, that way I don't. And I can, when I render it now, you can tell that, or you can see that the light source is dropping a shadow from the sphere to the box. And if I don't want this, I can deactivate that option here, and now I have no shadow dropping from the sphere. However, the cube would drop a shadow now. So when I just shortly just um, put the plane here, now the sphere doesn't drop a shadow, it's like a ghost, and the box drops a shadow. Have a look, you only see the shadow of the box, but not of the, of the sphere. So the last option is um, about sub-objects, so-called, like um, in the hierarchy. Um, I would just like to show you like this. Imagine the sphere is the parent of the cube, like so. And I want, I, I told the specified light source to, mm, to um, include the sphere only, then I can define whether the sub-object like uh, the cube in this case, um, is influenced by that same option or not. So like this, it gets treated just, uh, the cube gets treated like the top object, the sphere. If I turn this off, um, that setting is ignored. Okay. So, what could you use all that for? Um, in some cases it's cool to show something like a, a sphere. I want uh, this sphere to be rendered. So I just say um, include the sphere, okay, and include the plane. But I don't want the sphere to drop a shadow and maybe use a different object um, like that figure. Include that one as well, but maybe I want to just let the figure uh, drop a shadow. And now comes the funny part, I will um, tell Cinema to ignore um, this figure for rendering, so I click, use a right click, go to Cinema for D tags, and go compositing and now I can deactivate scene by camera so that way we will have the following effect there is a now we have a sphere that drops a shadow which looks like the one of a figure. It's quite funny, so, so you can fake stuff. For example, you could use um, different uh, window shadows or something which are um, not coming from your actual um, object you show in your scene.
Okay. Mm, now let's have a look at different settings. I will just set up that scene the way it was before. I delete my light source and put a sphere on top of a cube. When I use a new light source, um, I can make sh that way I can make sure that there are no uh, funky settings I forgot. And now we will talk about other light sources. Um, we had Omni so far. We, we touched Spot a little, so let's talk about this a bit more. Um, with the Spot it's important where you put it and in which direction you turn it. So let's hit R for rotating it and you can make it uh, illuminate this sculpture in the middle and by clicking on those outer um, little points you can increase the radius. You can do so as well by clicking on details and changing the outer angle. The outer angle makes the light go in more directions and the inner angle basically makes the transition from bright to dark sharper. If you put the inner angle lower or even to zero you will get soft transitions and the light won't change within that area. You can alter the aspect ratio so you just get a little, um, a little stripe like this or you can put it to something like this. I use a really low outer angle and a aspect ratio which is rather high, maybe 10, and that way I get a stripe in this direction. Let's put this back to the same values. So that's basically the difference between a point light and a spotlight. All the other settings are the same. Or at least they should be. Then there is infinite light, which is rather primitive. Um, and with a primitive light, it doesn't matter where you put it. Many people get this wrong at, uh, at the beginning, but in fact, you can put it anywhere you want. All that's important about an infinite light source is the angle. If you put it flat or really steep, and um, yeah, you can use this basically for faking sunlight in conjunction with ray traced hard or an area light. This will be perfect for rendering a sun. Now um, let's talk about the maybe most complex um, type of light which is the area light. The area light should... Excuse me, I just switched the, the, uh, the shadow type to area, but it should be like this. Um, you can tell that it's an area light if you get a symbol like that. And it works in conjunction with area shadows the best. But you can use this um, in conjunction with shadow maps too, but it's um, best to use it like that, area and area. And what makes the area light so um, useful is that it illuminates your scene quite realistically. Um, for example, you can make this the size of a window and you will get a very very soft illumination right here and even the shadow 
um, changes accordingly to your light source. So let me just show you when you're um, positioning a light source like that. Your light, uh, your shadow will look like this. And if you're using a really, really small um, stripe, it will, the shadow will change. If you use a really small light source, it will look like this. If you use a really wide one, the shadow will be washed out in this direction. The same goes for the illumination in general. If you have a really, really small area, then um, the, the, the lighting is more um, harsh than if you were to use a very, very huge light source. So the bigger the lamp or this uh, light area is, the softer your light setting. So for faking a window, I would just go to something, maybe 210, give it a little bluish type of color with not that much saturation. And this might look like um, on a rainy day or something. Then we go to details and you can change the outer radius. You can do this precisely by going to size X and size Y. And um, of course you can use any type of um, geometry for your likes. There is for example a disk or you can use a line if you want to imitate artificial light sources. It's just the line and a lot more, like a sphere. And you can use any kind of object or a spline. If you just drag and drop it here, then your... Okay, it doesn't... It does only work when you have the stuff converted. So let me just click on the sphere. Hit C on your keyboard or just click on Make Editable. And then it should be possible to just drag and drop the sphere into object. Now the light comes from the center where the sphere used to be. To make this really clear, let's just use a fall off inverse square. And now you can tell the light is coming from the sphere and not from that spot up there. But that's uh, something really special now. It takes some um, pretty much render time and it's a, it's a type of uh, lighting you, you might find hard to control at first. Maybe it's uh, easier to just put that light source um, in the center of um, where that object used to be, but it's a nice effect. And I'll go back to rectangle. There is uh, something dangerous about the um, area lights. At first, you should make sure you're not um, sticking the light, the area light, right into geometry. Um, I just turn off fall off for the second, uh, just go to none, and because if you stick the light right into the ground, you might get some bright spots. At the moment you're just seeing um, a dark line, that's another danger, and um, that's called the fall-off angle. The fall-off angle makes um, the light's intensity go from full brightness to dark in a circle. Let's see it from top. This is what uh, fall-off angle 180% is doing. In this direction it's bright, 
in those directions it's getting darker. It's realistic for Windows, but in some cases, um, for some Windows as well, it's good to use 0% because that way the light gets evenly distributed. So you don't get any black lines if you turn the fall off angle to 0%. And again, if you put this light source in there, in some cases you get ugly spots on the ground or wherever you put it. So make sure the area light is flying around or floating around freely. And then one more thing, if you're um, rendering it like this, you can change the sampling rate. In some cases you might not need, uh, need that many, samples and others, um, where, especially when you have um, that area light really close to geometry, the sampling rate could be uh, or should be uh, raised up to maybe 100 or so. I will uh, stick with the standard value and now there's a few more interesting options like um, the show and render. This makes the area visible or you can say show in reflection. So um, if you have a floor which is reflecting a little like so, then that light source will be visible. You can also tell the light source to not be shown in render but in reflection like this and you can multiply that um, with vis visibility so it looks really really bright um, a sampling rate that's much more important is the area shadow sampling. Um, we had this before, but um, you really need to, to um, define that and you can save a lot of time when if you put this rather low. Okay, that's the area shadow or the area light. And um, that should be the general introduction for lighting. So if I may conclude this, always check how do your light sources behave. Um, first, use lights, then think about where you put them, name them, dose their intensity and always give them a color. You don't need to use like, like that, colors like that, but um, they should have a slight color and whenever you create a new one, turn the other one off, name it, give it a intensity which might differ from the other light source so it makes sense and give it some color. Check what that specific light source does and then check how do they behave in conjunction. Then you might think okay this should be a little different. And there you go.